Welcome to the first installment of Pharmacokinetics and Pharmacodynamics of Anti-Cancer Agents. There's going to be several um, little um, clips going over these, this group of slides so that we can jump right into the, to the um, problems in class. First, I'm going to have a quick overview, and then we're going to talk about busulfan and how we use pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics to dose busulfan. Then we're going to talk about methotrexate, same idea, and finally we're going to sum up with some genomics that um, we know about that help us to more safely utilize these drugs. So at the conclusion of this discussion and case study, we sh you sh uh, the, program or the problems that we're going to do, you should be able to list and apply the differences that might be seen in the pharmacokinetic parameters in a patient with cancer. You should be able to recognize the drugs. So this, so that first one is about all the drugs that we'll see and what kind of kinetic and dynamic differences we'll see in those patients. You should be able to recognize drugs that have data. These are the anti-cancer drugs that have data to support the use of pharmacokinetic dosing and efficacy for avoiding toxicity. You should be able to discuss the clinical applications of utilizing kinetics and dosing busulfan and methotrexate. And then you should be able to suggest dosing regimen changes for an individual patient when you're given sufficient data to dose methotrexate or sulfan, by sulfan, busulfan, sorry. And then finally, you should be able to list any genetic predispositions or polymorphisms that are important in cancer treatment. First, what is different about a cancer patient than other patients that we need to be aware of when we are uh, dosing any drug? Well, first of all, you know, if we think about our trip through the body, which is usually where I start with kinetics, the first thing we have to worry about is absorption. As you know, many of the drugs that we use to treat cancer and the cancer itself can cause a lot of gastrointestinal distress. Um, so that may affect the absorption of drugs that are given orally. Um, so. For example, we know that patients have a lot of nausea and vomiting, especially with some chemotherapeutic regimens, and therefore the drug can't, is going to have its absorption disrupted if, it's, if you're throwing up or if the GI tract motility is altered significantly. Um, there also may be pH changes because of other drugs given. Um, there could be uh, surgeries that are needed to maybe remove tumors or for other reasons and those surgeries may change the uh, gastrointestinal integrity thereby changing absorption of orally administered drugs. Um, radiation therapy will possibly change the uh, GI tract. Um, chemotherapeutic agents themselves may um, alter the GI tract and therefore change absorption. And there may, patients may be given antiemetics that would decrease the peristalsis in uh, the GI tract, thereby uh, changing absorption. Um, so there's lots of things that can change the absorption of these drugs and so of any drugs that a, can that a cancer patient is being given. So you have to think about the absorption of any orally administered drug uh, for patients that are on chemotherapy. What about change in, in distribution or volume? Well, when I think of volume, I think, I think of obviously volumes in the body and then of course protein binding. We know that again, many of our patients don't feel good when they have cancer, so they don't eat and they have uh, a wasting or can become cachexic, so they lose um, body fat, they lose lean body mass, and can have decreases in volumes, specific volumes of distribution that way. Um, also, we know that patients will become um, hypoalbuminemic, hypoalbuminemic, will have decrease in their albumin. Uh, they don't eat as well, and therefore the albumin stores do start to uh, wane uh, during chemotherapy, and therefore you could see an increase in fraction unbound, of drugs that are highly bound to albumin. The opposite would be true for AAG. Remember, AAG is an acute phase reactant, and therefore you're gonna see an increase in AAG in many cancers, and therefore an increase in binding for these drugs. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, which will become important in methotrexate, 
is that um, you can have fluid buildup in places that it wouldn't normally occur because of tumors. Um, you can have pleural fluids and um, pericardial effusions. So you get these effusions, these buildup of fluids around the lung, around the heart, and other pockets in the body. They could be places where the drug resides and, even, and, cause, and act almost like a sink. Um, so you have to be careful of these effusions that occur in cancer patients that don't usually occur in normal patients. And finally, what changes in clearance might we see? Well, um, many of the drugs that we use to treat, chemo, to treat cancer um, are either hepatically um, tough on the liver and can cause changes in the hepatic function or tough on the kidney or both. And so you can see changes in hepatic and, and um, renal clearance because of toxic effects of the drugs. Okay, so there's a couple of ideas to think about with every drug that you give a patient that's, that's being treated for cancer. Now, let's think about how kinetics might be able to help us in actually dosing the drugs given to treat cancer. This is a partial list of, ke of chemotherapeutic agents that have been able to be have a kinetic parameter tied to a certain outcome. So for, your, for example, example, busulfan um, has been shown to have an area to the curve which correlates well to uh, hepatic toxicity that we see with busulfan and it also correlates with efficacy. So remember area to the curve is a, is a really good measure of exposure. So it's not necessarily surprising that we see that busulfan therapy um, is, we can use area to the curve to guide um, our dosing for both, that relates to both avoiding efficacy, I'm sorry, attaining efficacy and avoiding toxicity. As you read down the list, you can see carboplatin, the area to the curve is associated with thrombocytopenia. So probably the higher the area of the curve, the bigger the risk for thrombocytopenia with carboplatin. So if there's an area of the curve that we can be below and still be therapeutic, but yet not put the patient as at great risk for thrombocytopenia, that's where we want to be, right? Cisplatin, C-max has been associated with nephrotoxicity, cyclophosphamide. Okay, you can read through these. We're going to spend time on both busulfan and methotrexate, um, but this is only a partial list and there's more and more data always being gathered. This is an area where I think kinetics can really help patient therapy quite a lot. So I'm going to try to get you guys to feel a little more confident to help patients with busulfan and methotrexate and other drugs I'm sure will come along during your career. Okay, I'll see you in a few minutes, uh, or I'll talk to you soon um, when I come back and talk about Busulfan. Thank you.